Good morning, or I guess good afternoon. Um, I'm Allison Griffin uh, with Whiteboard Advisors. We are a social impact firm uh, focused on policy, advocacy, and strategic communications based out of Washington, DC. I'm thrilled to be here today with you all um, for our panel discussion about today's students need new policy solutions. Um, a couple of housekeeping items uh, before we begin. I think many of you have um, already been to sessions throughout the day. We're gonna be using the Slido app um, as a way for you to interact directly with our panel today. Um, a couple of key, uh, just key reminders about the app. Um, you'll wanna go to slido.com uh, to, to download the app and enter the hashtag um, South by Southwest EDU, uh, you'll see it here on the screen, and select our room, ACC 12AB. And as um, we have our conversation with our panelists this morning, um, and you wanna ask them questions, you can enter in your questions, I'll be following along, um, and integrate your questions into our conversation. So with that, um, let's get started. Um, just as a reminder, um, our conversation today is about today's students and federal policy solutions that are needed um, to better support them in their progression through higher education. And um, with us, we have a, an esteemed panel. I'm going to ask each one of our panelists to take a minute, um, introduce themselves, uh, give you a sense of um, where they are now, tell you a little bit about their work now, and actually where each of them um, spent some time um, in Washington, D.C. Each one of, of us on the stage um, have actually spent time in congressional offices, so bring um, a perspective um, from a policymaking standpoint as well as a practical application of, of policy work. So maybe to start things off, James. Great, thanks for having me. Uh, I am the president of the Institute for College Access and Success. We're a uh, research and advocacy nonprofit working for affordable college and closing disparities in college outcomes. And we work on public policies in Washington, D.C. and also in California. Prior to this job, I um, had a lot of different jobs around Washington, <laughs> education department, uh, Congress, education department again. And then most recently I was um, Deputy Director of Domestic Policy for President Obama. Um, hi, I'm Celia Hartman Sims. Um, currently, I'm a Vice President of um, Government Relations and Policy for Kinder Care Education, uh, which is the nation's largest um, private child care provider. So some of you may be saying, what the hell is she doing here? <laughs> um, I promise I did have a higher ed background um, prior and still kind of work in the world in that we have a large workforce. Um, that is in great need um, of higher education. But in terms of background, my Washington stint started in the Bush administration, um, um, the W, not HW. Didn't, I don't want to date myself that old. Um, and I was at the U.S. Department of Ed for the first term, worked primarily on K-12 and um, special ed, um, and then uh, moved over to the Senate to work for Senator Richard Burr from North Carolina. North Carolina was my home state. He had just been elected into the U.S. Senate and was looking for a North Carolinian um, who knew ed policy. And uh, in my time, he was on what was called, called, affectionately called the HELP Committee, or the Senate Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee. Um, he was on that committee, and I did all of his higher ed policy for him for about um, eight years. Hi, everyone. I'm Julie Keller. I'm the Executive Director of Higher Learning Advocates. We're a bipartisan policy and advocacy organization also based in Washington, D.C. We focus solely on the things we're talking about today, uh, how to support and update federal policies to meet the needs of today's students and where they are today. Um, in a previous life, I was also on Capitol Hill. Uh, I worked on the House side uh, for the Committee on Education and Labor, which is like the Senate Health Committee, uh, the committee that handles education issues. Uh, I worked for uh, the Democrat uh, chairman of the committee, George Miller. Great. Thank you all so much. Um, and to just bring the, the congressional experience full circle, um, I had the opportunity to um, be colleagues with each of our three panelists. I uh, worked for John Boehner when he was uh, chairman of the House Education and Workforce Committee. So um, we all have, which yeah. we should note, we'll call it different things. That is the same committee. It just changes names depending on who's, who's in charge. Who's in charge. That is correct. Um, so all that to say, uh, I, you know, everyone um, up here has deep uh, congressional and administrative experience. 
and I think that's important as we really begin to talk about um, the implications for federal law and federal regu regulatory um, topics and how they impact today's students. Um, so one would assume that the federal law, the Higher Education Act, is actually written in a way to support those who are pursuing post-secondary education in our country today. And actually nothing is quite further from the truth. Um, the law was actually, the last time it was updated was 10 years ago, and the demographics of today's students have dramatically changed since that time. So we're gonna spend some time finding out a little bit more about who today's students are, um, what some of the um, challenges are in the law and how it actually um, impacts or impedes students from being successful in higher education and um, hopefully intersperse that conversation with a little bit of um, reality of how a bill really becomes a law and how challenging it actually is um, in Washington to address some of these issues. So, to begin, I'm actually gonna start with Julie. And Julie, I'm wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about who today's students are, share with us some of the demographic data um, that Higher Learning Advocates has gathered, and um, help us understand what some of the challenges are facing today's students. Thank you, Allison. Um, as Allison mentioned, federal policies, state policies, most institutions were designed uh, around this idea of a student who comes right out of high school, hangs out for four years, learns some things, leaves with a degree, right? Uh, that's not who today's students are. So we know almost 40% of students are older than 25. See my cheat sheet here. Um, almost 60% of them are at two-year colleges. So that picture of the student playing frisbee on a quad at a four-year institution is not, certainly not the norm. Um, similarly, almost 60% of them are working either part-time or full-time while they're trying to get their degree. And as we'll talk a bit about more, a quarter of today's students are parents. So we know that the, what students bring onto campus and to their educational experience transcends the, what higher education is and can do. We often think about students as a student, and that's it. They're there to learn. They're kind of this person who's just a student. But that student today is juggling transportation issues, is juggling parenting and childcare issues, is juggling working and uh, shifts and uh, their work schedule along with their classes, um, and they're changing colleges more often. Um, so the challenges that they face is often things outside of the academics and the, the classrooms that they have other demands in their time they have other demands on their finances. And their, the scheduling, um, you know, sometimes it comes down to things as basic as they can't change when daycare is open, so they can't take that class that goes until 8.30 p.m. Um, or the bus time doesn't, you know, means that they're gonna be 15 minutes late to each class. Uh, and so the, just thinking about the whole person is what can sometimes um, and often trips up a lot of today's students. Thank you, and I am certain with some of the challenges in their own lives that are tripping them up, they are also being faced by increasing costs in higher education. And so James, I wanted to turn to you with respect to the work that TECAS does around affordability um, of higher education. Can you help lay the foundation for the affordability challenge that we're facing in this country? Um, for example, you know, average cost of higher education, average loan or debt burden, um, just help right size that that understanding with our audience. Yeah, I think this is a really important conversation. And education is an area where we all have extensive personal experience. And it sometimes can be difficult for people to look and appreciate the diversity of experience we have in our country. And in Washington, typically sitting around the table are people who had a four-year college degree by the age of 22 or 23, most of them uh, from a selective university. And it is difficult for them to see that most of our students are going to community colleges or regional public universities, which is just a different um, type of reality. And if you're concerned about helping many more students move up into the middle class, you have to be thinking about those kinds of institutions. And I learned for a period of time, I was working for um, Larry Summers at the White House. I love Larry. But I learned that if I wanted to talk to him about any of these issues, 
The first thing I'd have to say is, this is not like Harvard because X. <laughs> and, you know, on virtually any policy dimension, of course, Harvard will be at the far extreme. Uh, but for most of us, the college we went to is not a reliable guide. And so what we do at TKIS is we spend a lot of time trying to put forward the facts about the challenges of college affordability. And we know from research, not surprisingly, that college affordability is one of the biggest factors in whether students enroll in college and whether they complete. And again, because I think our mental model is skewed, we often prioritize um, colleges with high tuition uh, as, part of the pro as part of the affordability problem. Um, so we looked at what it costs to go to college in California, so we do a lot of work in California, and found that oftentimes, it's, if you include the full cost of going to college, including living expenses, books, transportation, it's actually more expensive to go to community college because the size of Cal grants that you're eligible for are so much smaller. Um, so we have a system that uh, systemically sends students who are low income, students of color, often older students who are trying to raise their own families to institutions that are underfunded and often more expensive for them, um, which is backwards if our goal is to try to open the doors of college to many more students. Thank you. Um, Celia, one of the things that struck me just in your opening comments um, was your, you identified your, your current professional role with kinder care. And while maybe on the surface it seems like um, that role is not currently connected to higher education. I actually think that it's more connected to this conversation today than we might imagine. Um, and so I would love to hear from you, what sort of um, challenges are we facing in early childhood education, both in terms of um, preparing students um, for their education journey, but also when we consider the adult student or the parent who is going back to college, um, what kind of challenges are you seeing in both um, the, the care that they're able to provide and the work you do? Sure, so um, at Kenny Care, we have around 30,000 um, early childhood um, teachers um, across the country. And they are, I mean, you look at it, it is the, it is the face of the quote, non-traditional student who, as Julie and both James have pointed out, is now the traditional student. When the majority of your students are older <laughs> than 25, I mean, the non-traditional is now what we all went through, which was the four-year experience in and out um, at a select university. Um, and as you know, Julie also mentioned, um, our, our, our teachers get hit on multiple ways on the, the working side and the parenting side, because the majority of our workforce is women, they are parents, and most often they are single parents. Um, they are often, it is a low pay, um, for the most part, um, environment, because it's a very labor-intensive um, industry. Um, and so they're trying to piece often many jobs together to make um, ends meet. And um, because they work in an industry that services working families, it's not as if they can take the middle of the day off to go take a class because they have the care of children and also because we take parents from any time of day that they need. A number of our centers will open at 5.30 a.m. or 6 o'clock in the morning and we don't close at 3.30 in the afternoon like a lot of the traditional schools do. We are there until working families can pick up, which is often 6.30, 7 o'clock. So, I mean, they are, I mean, they're hit on all the sides of it. What has been fascinating to me, and I mean, it's fascinating and that sounds like it's a positive, it actually has not been such a positive, but been so eye-opening to me, working in the early childhood sector, looking at this field that is predominantly women, low income, often minority, with a number of who have some college but no degree, um, is I think we all recognize when we worked on these issues that we did not have policies to address <laughs> this now traditional student or this working, but I didn't realize how disconnected so many things had become and how important it is to not just look at like what are the policies that we're not getting right on higher ed, but what are we also not getting right in the workforce development systems, which are very important. So for example, often um, early ed has been, people have tried to come at it from the, from the workforce side, 
Um, so we've created, there have been some industry um, recognized credentials, which I am completely in favor of, but to create an industry recognized credential that is not for college credit and that does not stack into an associate's degree, we have not done a lot for the women. We've done it, we've just given them a lot of courses that go nowhere. Um, and similarly, they've created workforce registries, which is like take a bunch of professional development, some of which is akin to like, I mean, I'm not trying to be negative, but like basket weaving, I mean, which is usually sometimes used to be the discredit of, of others. But again, it just, it stacks into nothing. Um, and then at the same time, at the, on the higher ed side, we've got policies that are still being dominated for this field by folks who come at higher ed from a very traditional way, delivery model. And a traditional delivery model whereby like four years at a four-year institution, sit in the seat, get that, is not gonna work for a lot of working women who have some college no degree, but also have a lot of experience. So the concept of um, prior learning assessment and competency-based, which are so critical, I think, for this workforce, are being like, we're not addressing them yet. So I mean, for, for us, for this workforce, it's trying to figure out how we weave together the various holes and misses between the workforce system and the higher ed system to make this work. Absolutely. Well, that's a great lead in because I know, Julie, through your work at Higher Learning Advocates, you all have constructed a policy framework and are advocating for a number of policies in Washington, specifically on some of the things that Celia alluded to. But can you tell us a little bit more about some of the, um, the work that you're doing to actually pull a thread through a variety of education related policies, especially for, for parents? Sure. Um, the pathways point that Celia was just making is. I think first and foremost, and, and the, a good overarching way to think about, um, or how we think about our policy reform. We can no longer think about federal policies in a higher education infrastructure that assumes a student comes in once, sits in a seat, and then leaves, and never re-engages with higher learning. That pathway between different types of higher learning, whether it's workforce training, uh, traditional institutions of higher education, prior learning assessments are these are competency-based models where it's not based on time, but based on what you can demonstrate you can do. Um, and even work-based learning and employer-based training, how for an individual can all those pieces be pulled together throughout their, their career? Right now in federal policy and many states as well, those are very discrete buckets and we make it very, very difficult to transfer those skills and knowledges and let that build um, for the learner. Um, so certainly, you know, we think about policies in, in that bucket. Um, particular to parents, um, there are a few things that are already on the books. There is a federal policy program uh, that supports child care on campuses. It's been woefully underfunded um, for, for a long time and recently re did receive additional money um, but it's still insufficient. It still doesn't meet the needs of all of today's student parents. Um, so we think that there needs to be a continuous supporting of that program, but also look for ways and allow for campuses to develop partnerships with, uh, with child care centers off campus or unaffiliated uh, with campus in order to make sure that those student parents do have that support um, that's not often covered by their, by their student aid and can be designed to meet the time schedules um, in coordination with the institution. Um, and Celia also mentioned, you know, that a lot of student parents are um, kind of outside of the higher education technical space. But to get to completion, you need to be able to afford it. You need to be able to um, uh, connect other pieces of, of, your, of your life. So we think about um, things like the child care tax credits. You wouldn't think that's a higher education issue, but it is. If you're a full-time, if you're working and you send your children to daycare or to child care of some sort, you get a tax credit for that. If you're a full-time student and you're not working you, and you send your children to daycare because you're a full-time student, you don't get a tax credit for that. Uh, so we, we think that being in school and being a student should be accounted for in the same way as, as working. Um, we also think that there's a lot more, particularly for low-income um, student parents, 
a lot more that can be done to connect the, the food security programs like SNAP with the higher education programs. A very low percentage of SNAP eligible students actually receive that aid. We think that even by creating an awareness check uh, between the FAFSA, the, the application for federal student aid, to say, hey, you've just told the federal government that you're low income, do you know that you might also be eligible for SNAP? Uh, even that kind of nudge, uh, we, th we think, could have a great, uh, great impact for student parents. Thank you. Um, James, so we've focused a lot of our time on student parents, and they're just one um, part of the student demographic um, you know, that make up today's students. Um, I know that Tika's just released a policy brief, um, I think in this last week, around unexpected expenses and the turbulence of low-income students. So whether they're student parents or not, this broader subset of students who are low-income. Can you talk a little bit about what you found in your research and what policies Tika's is advocating for in Washington? Yeah, so, um, you know, we have been longtime advocates for Pell Grants, um, which are currently fund the lowest share of the cost of attendance that they have any time in their history. So there's a gigantic structural funding gap for low-income Americans between what they have to afford to pay and what the college costs. What we did in this most recent brief is look at some of the look look at some of the complications around that structural gap that may make it even harder for some students to afford college. And if you look at um, the lives of low-income Americans, they're very tumultuous. And um, it is common for, for example, for want of a, um, a, a tank of gas, um, they lose their job. Because they lose their job, they lose their housing. And these problems can snowball. So especially when we are talking about today's students, I think part of the problem is people are thinking, yeah, college students have low incomes, but like, so did I. I ate ramen for a summer, and like a six pack of beer was a major expenditure for me. But like, then I graduated. But that's not the reality for many of these students. We're talking about the same people that our anti poverty programs are trying to serve. And so, other types of anti poverty programs, and Julie mentioned SNAP, but it's common for SNAP and these kinds of programs to have special eligibility rules for students. That, er that erect new barriers for them to get access even to the types of safety net programs that are intended just for basic subsistence like housing and food and medical care. So those are all, those are all major challenges. I think from the perspective of higher ed policy, one, we have to talk to our colleagues in these other fields and make sure they understand that we're all part of the same effort here. Um, but I also think that when we're thinking about college affordability, we need to keep in mind that when we say a student can work part time, that student is in the same low wage workforce that suffers all kinds of instability um, and job quality problems. That student may not be only responsible for supporting herself, but she may need to support her family. She may have in other types of individualized expenses that are not considered by financial aid budgets. So we, that's the point we were trying to make, that yes, we have this large structural problem, most people call it unmet need, but you also have individualized expenses and a great deal of financial instability in these lives that also needs to be taken into account if we're trying to address the college affordability problem. Thank you. So I want to take this in a little bit different direction. Um, we've talked about the sort of the national shift, or the shifts in the national student body, who today's students are. We've talked about some of the affordability challenges, and we seem to have a disconnect there. Um, in that space, there are also new providers who have started to emerge, or new ways of delivering education. Celia, you mentioned prior learning assessments or competency-based education. We have um, some of the boot camps, coding boot camps that have emerged in communities. Um, I think this begins to provide opportunity to students to pursue education in maybe a new or different way, but I think it also re raises questions about quality. And so I throw it out to the panel, um, why is it important for Congress to be involved in conversations around quality, and what has been the congressional role to date in that conversation? 
they're both looking at me. This is, this is a hobby horse of mine, um, <laughs> both on this innovation and quality um, uh, space. So, you know, I think there is, there is a space to have that as a singular conversation. Um, often it's, we need lots of innovation. We need new providers. We need to open up the landscape. No, we need quality. Don't open up the landscape. I think there's a way that we can think about in federal policy opening up this landscape and ensuring quality at the same time. If we think about quality from a matter of student outcomes, and if we think about uh, quality in terms of, again, this pathway or this creation of an ecosystem. Um, I actually shy away from calling these new providers new or innovative. Um, although many of them are, um, a lot of them are existing and have existed for a long time. Individuals have gone to training providers outside of the system of higher education for quite some time. What I think we've realized is we're losing that opportunity to connect back to higher education. As Celia was talking about, you know, her uh, teachers have training um, it, through the workforce system. But if they want to go pursue an associate's degree or bachelor's degree in teaching, that's lost time and money for them. They cannot bring those skills, those competencies uh, with them into higher education very often. Um, they start back from scratch and have to pay again to learn the things they've already learned. Um, and so that's where I think the conversation is innovative and different and interesting. Um, however, federal policy, it gets tricky because Pell Grants, student loans, there are a lot of money for a provider. Um, and you know, they go to a student, but uh, there's some imprimatur of kind of stamp of approval when the federal government says, yes, you can take your check here. Uh, and there's a responsibility from the federal government to say, you will be better when you walk out the door than when you walked in the door. The trickiness is figuring out what that better means and how to measure that and how to hold people accountable for that. But that's the conversation I think we, sh we need to be having. And then it opens up all sorts of possibilities if we figure that out. Yeah, I mean, this is, I mean, I think any of us or all of us who worked on the Hill, this is probably the one of the, the worst issues like that ever came up that we never have been able to resolve. And it really, we, I mean, we kick the can every time on it because no one can figure out. And we do have this thing called accreditation of institutions. And I think probably anyone who worked in the Hill says it's probably not a great measure of quality, but it's about the best thing we got. And it, but it's so now entrenched in who gets money and who doesn't that it just, it creates this, it's this Gordian knot we haven't been able um, to untie. Um, I don't have a solution for it. I mean, I did higher ed policy. I mean, we worked on that reauthorization bill for at least five summers. I uh, guess <laughs> staff do work in the summer on Capitol Hill, <laughs> which we used in to. August. <laughs> August. <Washington>, <laughs> um, and we, we did not resolve it. Um, what I am most interested in are like some of these things that are, we are calling new, which really aren't new today, getting more support for them and knowledge of them. I mean, this issue of prior learning assessment and competency-based education, it's not new at all. It actually, the federal government initially funded about four institutions to get off the ground back in the, I think, 60s was when Charter Oak and that group of um, college aggregators came into being through federal funding. And it's as if we found, like we were talking earlier, like if you stand in place long enough in higher ed, the idea will come back around. Um, and I've, we've stood here long enough and it's come back around and trying to get more attention for things that already do have a record. Now is it the perfect record, but they're within a system, they're going through institutions that have funding. I would like right now, I'm, more, I'm most interested in trying to get more attention to that and see how we can scale. But then there are different delivery models we're going to have to, to work on, particularly with distance learning and others, because most of our distance learning regs were written on the old um, correspondence course model, which is like you took a test on paper and you sent it in, and you know we're still stuck. Any thoughts on quality? <laughs> well, I have so many, uh, and I do agree a lot with what Julie and, and Celia have said. I think, I mean, obviously I'm for innovation. There are ways to do things better. Hopefully some people in this room have found better ways to do things better. Um, I think the challenge you have is one, oftentimes, can I say most of the time, uh, innovation doesn't work. 
There's a lot of fail. There's a high failure rate in innovation, and in Washington, innovation has been a code word for opening up uh, unlimited federal subsidies to unproven approaches with unknown accountability. So yes, if we can find a way to invest in new approaches, evaluate it, see if it works, and then apply traditional student aid to it, then I'm for it. If the idea is we're just going to take off rules without a clear idea of how that is impeding a better way to serve students, then I'm not for it. Fair summary. Thank you. Um, so I have a few more questions, but I also see that we have a number of questions that have come in from the audience. And one, I'd like to start with um, the one at the top and um, summarize by asking each of you um, to think about if you had a blank slate going into the reauthorization of the Higher Ed Act, um, reported that, or been reported that that may happen this year, we'll see. But if you had that blank slate, what would be the most important strategic pillar that you would build for a 21st century higher ed system? Where would you begin? I think, I mean, personally, and of course, it would start all over again. <laughs> like, it's just time to scratch and clean. I mean, every time we, it, it, I know that's not going to happen because people are very, I don't know how many pages the act is up to. It depends on, you know, which version you're looking at. But, you know, it's, it's too complicated. Um, and all of us are guilty of saying yes to add another program or provision here or there just to shut up somebody to move on to another topic that your, their bosses were more interested in. And so it's just become layered and layered and layered. But if I just say the one pillar for a student perspective, uh, particularly the non-traditional, what I'm going to say, the traditional student today, is simplicity. Mm that they can follow, that institutions can follow, that employers can follow. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, on early childhood uh, workforce, and everyone who's trying to work on the issue, is their intentions are good. I don't disparage anyone's intents. But when you are taking a, a workforce that is, for the most part, less educated, low income, working with lots of stresses, creating a I was telling James about this, in Alaska, they've created a career ladder with 12 rungs. And it's 10 rungs just to get to the associate's degree. That's too complicated for people to navigate. And similarly, like in the state of Illinois, it takes me 12 PowerPoint slides to explain how I move from step one to step two in a mm -hmm. workforce system. That's too complicated. And I know everyone's got their, you know, their thing and got their great idea, but if the, if the end user, which is the student, can't navigate it, we have failed. Well, uh, the question suggests free tuition. It also doesn't seem to be limited to the Higher Education Act, which I appreciate. Mm. Mm. Um, free tuition, you know, I was involved in President Obama's free community college plan. I like that idea. I, I don't think it's the single most important thing. I think it's, we need to keep in mind that tuition is not the only or even necessarily the largest cost. And I think it, it has, some states have tried to do free tuition in a way that ends up benefiting only middle class students. I think that's a big mistake. Um, and I think that it needs to be done in conjunction with ways to try and improve outcome. If I could do one thing to change the whole system, not just the federal law, but the whole system, I wish we recognize the importance of community colleges and regional public universities in trying to uh, help many more students earn a college degree and earn some economic stability. And our system is oriented around prestige. You climb the US news rankings if you reject more students uh, because it has no way to measure educational quality. You climb the rankings if you spend more money. Uh, and what we really need is a higher ed system that is more affordable, that's more inclusive, um, that serves their communities. And that's not um, the US News rankings. That's not how ambitious college presidents show that they're making a difference. And so if I could change one thing, it would be to value the, the institutions that really are inclusive, serving their communities, and helping uh, build the middle class. Um, so I get to cheat by going last because I <laughs> co-signed what both of them said. Um, uh, both in the system and in federal policy, the 
the kind of pillar I would hold at the center is student outcomes and student success. We have built a system around institutions and around access. And we've built a set of policies and, and incentives and things like US News and World Report that reward places um, for getting students in the door. And in fact, even in the best intentions, we reward institutions for uh, enrolling low income and other um, underrepresented students. Great. If I could do it from scratch, I'd reward them for getting those students through a program, uh, getting them to a credential or, or other end of value, of something that means something for the student, and putting that at the, that at the center, uh, rather than measuring um, kind of the inputs, let's measure the outputs, and let's look at the students first, not the institutions. So I appreciate everyone's um, response and I appreciate the question, so thank you for that. Um, but I also see there's another question that I think is a nice follow-up to the conversation we just had. We talked sort of at a, at a, a broad level um, about what you might do to recast um, the, the higher education system. Um, but I think some in the audience may have exposure to the things that are working in higher ed policy and also the things that are not, but some in the audience may not have a granular understanding of some of the issues that really are not working for students. So um, what are some specific aspects of the Higher Education Act um, that work against today's student? Maybe each of you could give an example of a specific policy issue. Um, that are cha that's a challenge to, to today's students. So um, let me actually give two specific examples because I think it's kind of two different buckets. Um, the first is for returning students. As I mentioned, you know, students don't go onto campus and leave and never enter again. Uh, a lot of students have some college, no degree. They need to come back or ha need to come back for a different uh, type of degree or credential. Um, for those students, particularly with some college and no degree, often that was not a positive first experience. Um, and their kind of academic track record carries with you no matter how long you've been out of school. Um, this is a, a specific, I'll, I'll get to the wonkiness of the satisfactory academic progress is a test that you need to be able to meet um, at your institution in order to uh, receive uh, federal aid kind of a degrees attempted over degrees completed ratio. So if you tried, you failed, uh, you left, and you want to come back, say, 10 years later, that track record follows with you. And so you start behind the starting line, um, and you need to take some credits and, and achieve them before you can even get federal student aid walking back into the door. Um, the other kind of more overarching thing, and, and Celia keeps mentioning competency-based education, um, is time. Everything in federal student aid, everything in the Higher Education Act is built around this measure of time, the credit hour. Most of us who went to a traditional program, you, you know a class is three credit hours. Okay. Um, that means something. And, but that means a certain amount of time on campus, in a classroom, and doing homework. Um, it also means something if you're full-time or part-time. And when a student wants to go out of that norm, if they need to go from full-time to part-time or vice versa, um, or if they want to uh, accelerate quickly through a program, um, it really trips up with, with federal student aid and can very easily make a student lose their eligibility. Thank you. Or yeah, James? I would think, um, and Julie had mentioned this earlier, um, is just one example. And this isn't just within the higher ed policy, but multiple of the other policies that, quote, support um, working families. Um, there's so many what I refer to as cliff effects in multiple programs so that are aimed at low-income individuals. So, and by that, it's like if I earn $1 more, I lose all of the support instantaneously. There's no graduated phase out, which one is a disincentive to work, but it's also just, it's just, it, it works against the logic of what it takes to, to raise a family. And most of these students of today are not just, you know, older, they have families to support. And then if they do have a, a spouse or another member, I mean, you put the two together and all of a sudden I don't qualify. 
Um, and an example I always remember um, from my time representing a state for North Carolina is there's something called trade adjustment assistance, which is basically meant in like manufacturing that's lost out because of you know various trade bills. We give folks supposedly money to go back to school, but there's such a cliff effect on it, and there's not a much. So we would see in North Carolina workers like they would lose, they get trade assistance after one mill plant closed down. They'd go to the community college to sign up for courses to get a degree. That what they didn't get enough to make to make ends meet, so they quit school. <laughs> to go get into an, and take another job. And then the moment they take that job and earn, you know, like five cents more, like then they're off of trade adjustment. They, they don't have the money. And it was just this cycle that they were growing from mill to mill to mill to mill until at some point, you know, like we're fighting over who's making the heel of the sock, not the whole sock in a trade agreement. And at the end of the day, they still don't have the skills to get. So trying to look at all of these policies systemically and ensuring there is some type of graduation for these families to ease as they're, you know, as they're working, because as much as, you know, folks may want, like, free college or whatnot, that's not happening in reality anytime near, so their folks are still going to have to be working and putting pieces together um, in both the near and I think probably the longer term, um, and we need to get these pieces right to ensure they can stay in. I mean, there are a lot. Um, <laughs> what types of expenses are eligible for financial aid? the ability, what types of other obligations students may have. Uh, Celia mentioned uh, how student earnings can reduce your eligibility for student aid. Um, we did a brief a few months ago on the issue of returning students. I know Julie mentioned academics. Um, we have a student loan crisis in our country. There are a million students defaulting on their student loans every year. Um, that's, you know, we have about 3 million high school graduates every year for context. So we have immense numbers of people defaulting on their student loans every year, which is, uh, can be devastating with a number of negative consequences, credit ruined, wage garnishment. Uh, in some cases, you can lose your occupational licenses. Um, of course, these students, people, when people think, when lay people think about the challenge of student debt, they think of the NYU student who has $120,000, but far more common is a student who dropped out in her first semester from community college or for-profit college, has a $5,000 loan, and that balance grows over time, and her economic prospects have not improved. We did a, we did a study on this as a barrier for returning adults, because one consequence of having a defaulted student loan is that you're not eligible for federal student aid. Now, I guess you could kind of understand what someone was thinking at some point when they put that in, you know, fool me once. But it has become, because our system operates now where the uh, system as a whole is so dependent on loans, we know that there are massive numbers of people who try, don't get through, default almost as a matter of course, and then are denied the opportunity to try again and get into the kind of job that would help them repay their loan. So it is a, it is a self-defeating consequence. I don't think there is a sound logic that shows that this consequence um, will help the federal government get back the money that it's owed. If anything, it does just the opposite. Thank you. Um, you all have touched on some very real issues that students are facing, but also that policymakers are grappling with. Um, so, you know, Washington, D.C., and even federal policy seems so far away, you know, even from where we, you know, where we are today in Austin, or maybe for each of you in your own respective lives. Um, so as a former staffer, congressional or administration staffer, what advice do you have for those in the audience who want to ensure that their voices or ideas are heard, either by policymakers or um, in this policy context, in this conversation? Uh, show up, I think. Um, in my experience, policymakers and their staffs are very eager to hear what people want to think. Um, you know, I think um, they will almost always take a meeting. Uh, they will read your letter. Uh, they will write you back. And I think people may think that policymakers aren't listening because they write in and say, please do X, 
and the policymaker doesn't go out and immediately do X, and they go, okay, well, that just shows. <laughs> um, you know, we have a huge country. We have uh, tons of different perspectives, um, and policymakers are trying to filter people's all kinds of different experiences and expertise in data, um, but they are listening, and they are trying to synthesize that information. I think, um, you know, the more... Um, grounded your um, arguments are. Uh, people, some people respond very well to stories and personal experiences. Other people like, you know, PhDs in regression analysis. So it depends a little bit on your audience, but I think bringing powerful stories, powerful data, a clear message, you know, does impact people's thinking. Yeah, I think following on, um, James, we were talking about this earlier. Um, I, and I was reminded of it because it's like the beginning of March, which is what's towards the end of February has just passed. And if you ever get up to D.C. in February, um, the halls are packed. <laughs> it is group after group after group of various um, beliefs and whatnot. And I always used to tell people, like, don't be offended that I got to take your meeting in, like, this corner of the hall because it's the last space I can find today, and you are meeting, like, 22 but I've got, you know, you've got me for 30 minutes. Um, they do, folks really do want to understand how the policies work. Um, one advice um, I've been giving to people over the last couple of years is because I saw this as a change in things as I was leaving. Um, and it's, it's a plus and positive of um, uh, email and the internet. Hmm. Um, I am not a big, like, I think if you're going to like want to talk to Congress, if you're on somebody's website and it says click here and then like submit a letter, that stuff has kind of become a wash for a lot of folks because it's just like offices are being inundated with thousands of the same email. And oftentimes people don't even realize they've hit it. And you call a person like, well, I did send that email. I'm like, well, were you on this website? And like, oh, yeah. So well, what do you have to say? Um, one thing I tell you, it's a really easy trick to learn staff email addresses, <laughs> both in the House and the Senate. They work on like really standard protocol in the Senate. It's first name underscore last name at senator.senate.gov, and in the House is first name dot last name at mail.house.gov. They're really easy. I mean, the best thing, send a personal email. Find out who the staffer is. Send a personal email. And you can find the staffer if you just call the office in D.C. and ask, who's the staffer who handles X issue? Send that email or ask to speak to them individually and make a connection and make it an ongoing connection with that office. There were numerous folks that, I mean, became my, like, check-in list on any given issue, and they were from a wide swath of folks in North Carolina, and they were just folks who kept in touch with me on how this issue affected them. So for engagement, try to get as personal as you can via phone or the personal email. Great advice. Julie? So I second both of those things. You know, I think it's important to remember, first of all, the staff are, um, I think, say this as we're all former staffers, <laughs> as equally uh, and sometimes more influential than getting to the member. Uh, the member, as any executive of any organization, is thinking kind of big picture, has lots of things on their mind. That staff person, it's their job uh, to think of problems and solutions to feed that, uh, feed that member. And so often getting to that person um, is sometimes overlooked. People always want to have the photo up with the, the member of Congress. And that's great and important to, to bring back home, but to actually get changed on developing that relationship with the staffer is incredibly important. Um, and I always advise people to bring solutions. Federal policy in, in DC seems very far away, and I, and I often hear from people, oh, well, what do I know about federal policy? Just about as much as that staffer knows about what's going on in your work, <laughs> right? Um, that bringing, saying, this is the thing that we're seeing on the ground, and this is how you can help me. That second part that's really, really helpful. Um, these folks have 20, 20 22 meetings a day, kind of half hour <laughs> clips, um, and often hear people's problems, which is good, but they don't know how to help, and they want to help. So bringing them that, hey, and this would be helpful, it doesn't have to be, and here's the piece of legislation I want you to introduce, but here's the problem that I think you can help me with solving, um, it furthers the conversation uh, to be able to be on that call list, come back to and say, okay, great, I heard your problem and I want to solve it. Does this work? Does this actually help you? Um, but you need to be in that solution space in order to have that conversation. 
Great, thank you all. I think that's great advice. The only um, additional thing that I would tack on is with respect to connecting with members of Congress, um, that doesn't have to just happen in Washington. So remembering that you know you everyone has their own congressional representative. Many many times has multiple district offices across um, your sp specific area. Um, your senator also offices across your state, and so there are people who are actually on the ground in your community who may act who may understand the issue or the complexity of the issue a little bit better even than the person in Washington. So connecting with your member of Congress or their office um, doesn't always have to happen in Washington. It can happen on the ground as well. Um, I know we have about 10 minutes left, and we do have a couple of questions that have popped up on the screen, but I also want to open up um, our microphones to anyone who would like to ask our panel a question. Is there anyone who would like to, to offer a question? Uh, for consideration or discussion in the, in the time we have remaining. If you could step up to the mic and, and um, give your name and ask your question, please. Hi, I'm Robin. I'm, can you hear me? <clears throat> Sorry. I'm Robin Lerner, and I used to be based in DC. I'm now based here in Austin. Um, and a former Hill staff for myself, so <laughs> we're all recovering. Um, <laughs> so I, I don't know if I missed this, but who is actually pushing for uh, reauthorization? anyone a reauthorization at all period mm -hmm. um Patty like, murray and lamar alexander it appears right. <laughs> yes. right uh you know senator alexander from tennessee is chairman of the senate education committee he has two years left um in senate he's a former college president and it's clear that he has some things that are important to him that he wants to accomplish before he goes fafsa simplification uh, simplification of the student loan repayment plans, of which there are nine or something, um, some amount of deregulatory burden. And the senior Democrat on the Education Committee is Patty Murray from Washington. Um, she has a list of priorities that include uh, some, some improvement in affordability, some improvement in accountability for the lowest performing colleges, equity, and she's very concerned about um, what Secretary DeVos is doing to the Title IX rules around sexual assault. So what you have there is um, a potential package where both Senator Alexander and Senator Murray may agree that is better than current law. It doesn't mean resolving free college, resolving the role of for-profit colleges. It just means the two of them might agree that's better than doing nothing, especially for Senator Alexander when he's like, it's my last shot. Senator Murray, you know, um, has had a relationship of working with Senator Alexander. Two of them are very powerful senators, uh, proven legislators. On the House side, you know, of course, you now have a Democrat running the Education Committee. House side bipartisanship, you probably know, is, uh, I'm sure you know, is um, much less important. Um, but you have, uh, 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 a Democrat there that will help balance out Senator Alexander, give Senator Murray some comfort. So, you know, I mean, I would never advise someone to go to Las Vegas and bet on Congress taking action, <laughs> but I would say this is the sort of the most favorable alignment that we've had in a while and maybe more favorable than we have um, uh, in the future. Any other crystal ball predictions different from James? No, I think James summarized it um, quite well. Just a, another bit of, of context for those who haven't been watching Higher Education Act. So these pieces of legislation, um, these kind of big packages like the Higher Education Act have timelines to them. Um, so we are now in, it's five years overdue. Um, so there's some part of, kind of the business of Congress of saying, okay, next on the list is the Higher Education Act. Um, and in the House of Representatives last Congress, when it was under Republican control, um, the uh, Republican then chairwoman of the committee, um, uh, Chairman or Dr. Fox from North Carolina, where higher education is also a big, big issue for her, she passed a partisan bill through her committee. She was not able to get it passed through the full um, House of Representatives. Uh, and so the process kind of died there. But these are all steps along, I like to think of reauthorizations as marathons um, and with little mini sprints in them. Um, and so there was a kind of a sprint last Congress over in the House of Representatives um, that 
now things have quite changed over there. But um, so there is some some momentum behind it and some urgency. Um, I think advocates like like us and others have certainly been talking about the need for change and how the mismatch between the law and reality is ever growing. And so there's been a, some outside pressure as well um, to start looking at some changes. I guess for me, I mean, I'm, I'm hopeful, but what I don't want to see happen, but I feel probably is most likely to happen, is that there will be this desire to get something passed that does not really result in the change that is needed. It will be superficial, but both sides can claim they got something out of it, but it won't be like the really big change that's needed. And I mean, I recognize that doing big change in statutes is very difficult. It's also even more difficult if you want to cross like jurisdictions and like you want to have a conversation with ways and means and finance to make some of these pieces work that makes it more complicated. But I, I just think higher ed is one of those that like we're going to have to get a lot more committees and members to really address a number of the pieces that have. So I'm hopeful, but I'm also somewhat of a, I think a realist. Um, but as Julie said, I mean, it's sometimes it just takes a lot of time together over summers with staff to move things along. I mean, there were at least, I remember three that you and I spent in rooms because we were going to do higher ed that summer. Um, and eventually we did do it. So, you know, it just, it takes time. Are there any other questions from the audience? Yes. Um, hi, John Elfuth from the National Governors Association. And uh, my question is, um, if there is no act, or if, as Ms. Sims uh, postulated, potentially we have one that doesn't resolve a lot of these big issues, uh, what would each of your uh, one want or need be from states? If, if the federal government's not going to act in this, what would you like to see states? If you had to pick one. Well, I think while there's a lot that is definitely dictated by the federal government in terms of Pell Grants and, and loans, there are a lot of pieces where states could step in, particularly on simplifying systems. I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, it is this, if it's a public university and even some of the privates, I mean, you're dictating, you've got power over articulation agreements and what can move from institution A to institution B. Um, you've got far more power over the workforce system than the feds do. So why, you know, maybe try to figure out how to make it less complicated and how it couples up with the higher ed system. So even though it doesn't happen, I think there is still a lot of work um, and authority that states have to act. Um, it's very typical. We've all seen this in policy for states and the feds to point the fingers at the others to say, well, I couldn't do it because the feds said I couldn't do it, and I can't do it because the state won't do it. Um, you know, everyone's an executive in the state, so be an executive. I, I would echo that of um, you know, the power of states to think about the connecting the systems is, is so much more than the federal government. Um, federal policy is in the crisis level is a financial relationship. It's a, it's a banking relationship, really, between a student and, um, uh, and the federal government uh, on affordability. Because states provide the bulk of the direct-to-institution funding, particularly for public institutions, that opens up a different kind of conversation about how they're serving students, where they're spending their money, what systems they're connecting to. And states can provide such a leadership role in driving that conversation. Um, either in conjunction of or absent of federal policy. Thank you. John, you know this stuff so well. I would just say reevaluate their how they allocate their resources through an equity lens and try and help um, students facing the greatest financial need um, and invest money where it will do the most to get students um, through college. So we have just about a minute left, and I'd like to end our conversation today. I don't think it's often that you get to sit in a room with former congressional or administration staffers. Um, and so I would be curious to know what, inf what maybe anecdote or um, a, little, uh, a little sidebar story can you tell us about how a bill really becomes a law in Washington? What won't we read in a civics book? So in the most optimistic side of it, right? <laughs> what you won't read in a civics book is folks like us sitting around a table um, trying to get things done. You know, Celia and I worked on the last reauthorization together. We 
worked in uh, different chambers, different parties. Um, our bosses could get out there and say diametrically opposing things to one another. Um, and we'd be in the back room as they're doing that, saying, okay, how can we get this done? What, did, what, are, we, what are you hearing? What are you hearing? Uh, what do you know about your state or your district or the people you're talking to? Um, and what are the solutions that we can bring this together? And then how can we sell it back to our boss that each of them got a win, even though they were saying the opposite things? But Congress is filled of those people who just want to get the work done and who work across party lines at all times. Um, you know, and so I, I think of, actually, my antidote is, I remember one day sitting at a conference table with a very specific program that was very important to North Carolina. <laughs> and I just, it's like, whatever Celia wants, <laughs> right? She knows the program the best. She knows what's right. I trust that she knows what's good for students. And over lots of Costco-based snacks, we just <laughs> figured out <laughs> what could get done. But I knew she had the expertise, and so I just said, whatever Celia wants. Yeah, so, and I think that's really the hidden story is that's not told is how much it is personal relationships and long-lived relationships. Um, like our bosses could go out again and say, you know, as Julie said, the diametrically, diametrically opposed. But even them behind the scenes want, for the most part, the good legislature want to cut a deal that works for um, their constituents. So there is a lot of bluster, but it's, I think, important where there are also a lot of relationships, both at the staff and between staff and members, to get things done. So I'm going to take a moderator point of privilege and thank James, Celia, and Julie. I'm going to um, end on a high note. Um, collaboration and, um, uh, and working together um, in Washington on behalf of today's students. Thank you all so much for being here. Appreciate it. <laughs>